Um, I'm a classicist, and one of the things I like looking at is the relationship between the ancient and the modern world, to think about the extent to which the ancient world influences the modern world, and the different ways in which aspects of contemporary society let us go and understand the ancient things. So today what I want to present to you is a little bit of that, but also just basically one of the platonic texts that we've still got, and its relationship with love. Think about understanding material which continues to pose problems for us all the way through. Let's see if this works. Great, so we've all heard the term platonic love. And on a day like today, it's possibly not one that most of us would want to receive in those unsigned cards. So I looked it up in the OED. What does it say it means? Of love, affection or friendship, intimate and affectionate, but not sexual. Spiritual rather than physical, now usually with a lowercase initial. The lowercase initial perhaps suggesting it's lost something of the Plato with a capital P, lost something as a personalisation. First recorded instance in the OED is not until 1638, though. 2,000 years after Plato actually wrote about love. So it says to me that something's happening throughout uh, contemporary history that changes our understanding of love and its roots in its ancient um, history. It carries on through some rather uh, nice modern versions, though, um, particularly the Huxley, if you want to have a look at that. So, yeah. who was Plato to give us this platonic love? Another fairly famous quotation about him from Whitehead, the safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Something a lot of us have heard but a lot of us haven't necessarily thought about what does it mean to follow in the wake of Plato and what is it that we're taking from him. I feel that in focusing on love as a platonic concept, we've rather become over-Christianised and the biblical texts and the biblical uses of love sometimes take over a little. And what we get are people like C.S. Lewis in 1960 writing a book called The Four Loves drawing on Plato and on a whole history of terms for love based in the Greek language. We have agape, the Christian, religious, community love felt for people in fellowship, in koinonia. We have storge, not a term with which most people are familiar, the familial love and affection within the household. And we have philia, brotherly, brotherly love, love between friends. But how much are any of these used in someone like Plato? I had a quick look through the Greek corpus. Where have I written these down? Good. Um, agape. Used 83 times in Plato, but only three times in the main text on love. Don't think that kind of community love is quite what he's talking about. Storge. Not used at all until later literature until Christian times. So it's definitely not there for Plato. Philia, well, philos, meaning love, giving us philosophy, love of wisdom, philology, love of words, all of those kind of things, is such a common prefix that we've got 685 examples in Plato with phil in it, um, including 56 in the symposium, which I'm going to move on to, in 36 different variations. It's far too common for me to want to try and attach any meaning to what Plato's doing with it. Which leaves us with the fourth one, eros. We obviously get our term erotic love from it. Again, going to the OED, Freudian psychology, the urge towards self-preservation and sexual pleasure. It's distinguished from things like agape as being specifically physical, specifically sexual, and specifically psychoanalyzed quite often. And this is where Plato, I think, does become much more important in understanding Greek concepts of love. There are 382 uses of anything to do with eros in Plato, 100 of which are the name itself, and 74 of those 100 uses are in the one work, the symposium. So it's eros, not agape, not storge, not philia, 
that's important to the symposium. So what is a symposium? Well, a symposium itself is a male-only drinking party where people gather to eat, drink, play games, discuss things, and possibly end up with groups of flute girls, dancing girls, and the like coming in to entertain them. Plato's text in particular deals with an evening post-drama. It's an evening after they've drunk to excess. And they come in, and they're all rather hungover, but they've decided to have this party anyway. And they agree at the start, what they're going to do is not drink, 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 drink. They're going to have very moderate drinking, water it down rather than more than usual, and actually have a full-on discussion about the nature of love. They've decided they're going to eulogise love, and they're going to give us some fantastic stuff about it. But the whole thing degenerates quite quickly. The symposium is introduced to us by someone called Apollodorus. Someone in the street says, Apollodorus, tell me, what happened at that famous dinner? And Apollodorus says, I don't know, I wasn't there. But my friend was, and he told me about it. So Apollodorus' friend, Aristodemus, told him about the dinner. But Aristodemus didn't speak at the dinner. All he did was listen to everyone else and memorise or summarise their speeches. So most of the dinner is about people making speeches about love. But then finally you get to Socrates... And he doesn't give you a speech, he tells you about a conversation he had with a woman called Diotima. So you've got Apollodorus giving you Aristodemus' words, giving you Socrates' words, giving you Diotima's words. At which point you stop thinking Plato's actually trying to convince you of anything at all, other than process. There's something more going on here than any kind of truth value. Within it, we've got a series of speeches, which gets significantly more silly as we go along as well. We start off with people claiming things about double loves and primordial loves, and then we come to the doctor, Eric Simicus. And he says, I'm a doctor. What I can see is people need balance. People like in music, you need harmony to make things work. In medicine, you need to make sure people don't have too much of one thing or too little of another. We can balance out the humours, all that kind of thing. And for Eric Simicus, the doctor, love is about finding that balance, giving people what they need, taking away from them what they don't, making things like harmonia. Most famously, you then get Aristophanes. Eryximachus has only spoken because Aristophanes is so busy hiccuping, he can't talk. And when he stops hiccuping, he comes up with this wonderful myth. Originally, there were three kinds of human. There were the humans, um, there were men, men, women, women, and men, women. Double-headed, four-limbed, fantastic got too big for their boots, stopped giving Zeus what was his due. So Zeus got crossed, split them down the middle, told Apollo to turn their heads round so they could see the split, i.e. the tummy button, and people spend the rest of their lives looking for their other half. And then we come across the idea of Eros as a beautiful, lovely young boy. Agathon comes in. Agathon, in whose honour this party is being thrown, it's all in the aftermath of Agathon winning the tragic contest. The gorgeous boy. But Socrates isn't very happy about that. Because Socrates starts saying things like, well, if you're chasing something beautiful, can you be beautiful yourself? Does it make any sense to chase what you've already got? Or are you only ever going to be looking for something you don't have? Therefore, there's absolutely no way Eros can be nice. And actually, Eros is the summation of what is lacking. Eros is ghastly. Eros is horrible. Eros, Eros is old, seeking youth. Eros is the sum of poverty and plenty, lacking in everything, but willing to find resources. This is Dementor. I started playing around with some of the ideas. If you're constantly lacking something, are you going to remove it from whoever you seek it in? Or are you only going to contribute back again? Where in Plato's model does this work? Because it sometimes seems, feels like it's going to be a very top-down model. Um, and I think, thankfully, I've come to the conclusion that there is room, if you look at Eryximachus, for that balance to be restored without destruction to whatever's supplying it, etc. But what you do get is this overarching sense of lack. For Eryximachus, there's a lack of harmony. For Aristophanes, you're lacking your other half. For Socrates, we're lacking a full understanding of autotokalon, autotokalon, the beautiful itself, 
which he later comes to discuss as truth and goodness itself. So all the way through, he's talked about things in a slightly comical fashion, with this ridiculous overarching narrative framework. He's had the silly myth in there, he's had the hiccups, he's had all kinds of things happening. And I think that the symposium is as much text about how to learn as it is about what love is. He teaches us through lecture, Eric Simicus just comes and tells us. He teaches us through myth, through what Aristophanes tells us. He teaches us through narrative, through Apollodorus giving us what's happening at the dinner. He teaches us through Alenchus, through questioning, Socrates pulling out of um, Agathone why um, Eros can't be that gorgeous boy. And he teaches us through dialogue, Socrates and Diotima discussing what, is, what, what they feel really is going on with love. We get all kinds of phrases from Plato. The best one, I think, straight from Plato is love conquers everything, which is there in Agatho. Love is a many splendid thing. Well, not according to Plato, it's not, because then it wouldn't be seeking many splendid things. Love lifts us up where we belong. Well, maybe that is it. It's about yearning, it's about searching, it's about going upwards and seeking the best we can be for ourselves. I will always love you. Well, if love is partly a yearning, then as human beings, we are always going to be yearning, and that is always going to be an act of love. These kind of modern things do have some kind of role in understanding Plato. So what I think, I've come to think now, is that it's not just a question of who Plato loves, it's a question of what Plato loves and how Plato loves. And what he loves is truth, education, and community. What we've got here are three images based on a later poem about love as a bittersweet, obsessed um, yearning from Catullus. And I think that ambiguity is what Plato leaves us with. And I very much hope that no one does say to me in the immediate future that all they do is love me platonically, because I'm not sure I'm going to know what they mean. <laughs>